Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to today's meetup. We're so happy to have all of you to join us here today. Um, my name is Dalia and I work on the community team of Elastic. So today we're joined by several awesome professionals from ADN, and I'm sure most of you know um, ADN, that it's a Dutch uh, payment service provider. So during this meetup today, our awesome four speakers who share their experience um, in delivering operational excellence with Elastic. Uh, but more particularly, they will talk to us about how they handle millions of transactions in milliseconds with Elastic. As I mentioned, we have four speakers today. Um, each one of them will introduce themselves before they start presenting. Um, we hope that each talk will take approximately 10 to 15 minutes, and we will take a couple of questions after each talk, and then we're going to open for a general Q&A after the last one is done. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, I would like to welcome Willem, who's going to be our first speaker today. Go ahead, Willem. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me quickly share my screen and start the presentation. All right, can everyone see it? Cool, cool, cool. So I'm Willem. Uh, I've been a Java developer at IGN for four years now. I'll be talking a bit about the IGN generic architecture so nothing in particular i will leave that to the people after me that will talk about the juicy elastic details but just to give you some idea of uh yeah what we do at ign and and how we kind of manage our data going through the system just uh just overview um so i think yeah uh, dalia mentioned it we're a payments processor right but the question is what does that actually mean, right? So let's let's start with the core of our proposition. Uh, you're a shopper and you go to a, a, a merchant, let's say a pub, you give your card. And then the question is, how does the, the pub, you wanna buy beer, but how does the pub know whether there's enough money in your card to pay for the beer, right? Uh, it's tricky because you have a relationship with the issuer because you got the card from the issuer, right? That's your bank that's on the card and the issuer knows how much money is on the card, but the merchant doesn't. So that's actually the problem we're trying to solve, right? So how do we solve it? Well, the merchant sends the payment to Aten, uh, then we either forward it to an acquirer in some cases or directly to a scheme. Scheme with someone would be someone like MasterCard or Visa or any of the other schemes. The scheme then checks with the issuer, hey, Willem wants to buy beer. Is there enough money on this card uh, to actually buy this beer? The issuer says yes or no. And then the message goes the same way back to the merchant. Um, this is very nice. Uh, this is the first problem because the, the, uh, we solve because the merchant obviously doesn't just want to accept uh, cards from, for example, MasterCard, but also from Visa. And if they're in the Netherlands, also ideal. Uh, so what we do as IGN is we abstract all of this away for the merchant. So the merchant just has to make one integration uh, to IGN, and then we handle all their payments. So not just different payment methods, but also different ways of paying. Uh, and that's actually what we get to now. Um, yeah, before I forget to mention, we do more than this, but this is payments processing, kind of the core of what we do. We have a lot of other products next to it, such as uh, issuing, for example, and a solution where we split the amount that's being paid out to a platform and sub-merchants. But let's keep it simple. Let's stick to the basics, which is, in our case, payments. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Again, I'll keep it quite high level. Um, but so how does it look, right? Uh, as I mentioned, we can accept payments from uh, point-of-sale terminals, so in the store but also direct API calls and also uh, through our checkout product where we have an SDK that you uh, install in your app or in your website and we accept these payments. So what's nice about iGen is that all of these eventually come into the same entry point, which is the payment uh, acceptance layer. Um, and because we abstract the different payments coming in at that early stage, that actually makes it a lot, lot easier to deal with the data later on. So it's not like in our accounting system, a point of sale payment is very different 
from uh, appointment originating from our SDK, for example. Uh, they're basically the same. They will have different metadata associated with them, but because we make it abstract and uniform already in the beginning, this offers a lot of advantages to us later on when processing the data. So a bit about this, this front end, right? Um, we actually have a lot of instances running and they're all stateless. So that means that we can scale them linearly. And if you do often a payment consists of two parts, you have the authorization and you have the capture. So for example, you might've seen this when checking into a hotel, right? They will authorize a certain amount on your credit card, but they won't deduct it immediately. Only if you drink the mini bar or trash the hotel room, right? So what it means that our poll is stateless. So our front end is stateless. It means that any of these forms can actually send it to any of our front end applications, uh, servers anywhere in the world. This, uh, this makes it very easy to, if one of these machines goes down to just send the traffic a different way. Uh, and that makes it quite resilient. So, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I thought it would be nice to give you kind of an overview of how the system works and what's important for each of the parts of the system. So what we kind of have here is our synchronous processing. There are other web applications here, such as a risk web application and a tokenization engine and, and things like that. Uh, and our connections to the scheme, of course, but this is all part of the synchronous processing. So whenever, something comes in here we want to process it fast and we give an immediate result back to the merchant so this would be you pay for something and immediately say okay your payment is approved uh, like in the bar example we mentioned before so as i mentioned this this layer is stateless uh, we have synchronous responses and that means that we have to have very high availability and low latency because as you can imagine the main priority of our merchants here is that we can keep processing payments, right? If you're uh, in a um, uh, fast food restaurant, for example, and they, they can't process any cards, then they have a very big problem, right? So that's that's the main priority here. Then after that, we have our accounting layer. So that's actual several uh, charted, it's a charted database. So it's a several databases that each can handle um, can store transactions. So that's kind of our source of truth. And there we have different priorities, right? So there the priority is very much on consistency because we're dealing with financial data. All the data that's in there um, has to be correct. And I think this is this is also a good moment to mention that we, uh, we are very big Postgres users. So that's what we use uh, for that. Apart from our Elastic Sec that kind of underlies all of this and you will hear the different use cases afterwards um and then there's a kind of third layer deeper um which is our reporting uh layer so once you have all that data in the different accounting clusters you have to somehow combine that to give report reports to our merchants uh so their focus really is also of course consistently because it has to be correct but also very much on throughput because it's a lot of data coming in. I mean, we do hundreds of transactions per second uh, and they all relatively fast have to go through the whole system because they have to end up in a report for our merchant. So the focus is really on throughput. Uh, we built our a custom streaming framework comparable to Kafka, but at the time we built it, Kafka did not fulfill the uh, exactly once guarantees we needed because again, we're really dealing with financial data. So, so, uh, we can't have any mistakes or any missing events or something. Um, and then we also have a Spark Hadoop cluster that uh, we use for uh, machine learning and also generating reports. Um, this is the setup for the, the, the payment processing, but it's actually closely mirrored by, for example, uh, our in-house bank that we that we built. Uh, it kind of mirrors this, this setup of tiered uh, architecture. Um, let's see, did I forget anything? Yeah, I think custom streaming, I think Bengisu will talk about that a little, uh, later. Um, and again, 
all of this is hooked up to our AUX stack, right? So uh, that's really underlying also a lot of these mechanisms. Are there any questions? Awesome. Thanks, Willem. Let's see if anyone is going to ask something or maybe at the end of the presentation when we're all done. Yeah, it's quite a short short overview, right? But uh, I hope it kind of gives you a, f a frame of reference for the, for, the, uh, for the other presentations that will follow. How about with the questions at the end? The... <laughs> okay, then we're going to give the floor to our second presenter. Thank you, Sue. Let me make her a presenter. Yeah, so we don't use Kafka to Fabio, your question. It's similar, but it's built in-house and custom. All right. Then me and I are going away and uh, we'll leave the floor up to you, Bengiso. Yeah, do, do you see my big uh, screen? Okay, because I don't. All right. Um, yeah, so my name is Ben Yusu, uh, and I work at IDM for three years as a backend developer. Uh, today, my uh, use case is payment search, um, and I'm going to tell uh, how we make this uh, millions of payments to uh, our merchants available uh, for search. Uh, but also, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, how we migrated the Elasticsearch version 1.7 from 1.7 to 7.6 for uh, payment search. Uh, so, uh, what is payment search? So, we have a customer area web application that we pr uh, provide for merchants that they can uh, gain some insights on their payments, and the most used. Uh, functionality of this application is the payment search. Uh, so I'm going to show how does it look like to, to give you a bit an idea. Uh, so this is the, the payment list that uh, merchants can see their payments in the real time. And then they can perform some filters on top of them, like, for example, on a specific payment method or some specific uh, status or amount, anything. Uh, or they can just search with a specific uh, reference number to uh, to reach to a payment and perform some, some actions like refund, uh, for example. Uh, so what is, what is the history of payment search? So in 2011, the first uh, Lucene implementation was done. Uh, and then in 2014, because of the, the problems with writing to a growing single Lucene index, the migration uh, to Elasticsearch was done for the first time when it was version 1.7. Uh, yes, and since uh, 2014, there was no update on the Elasticsearch site. Uh, but in 2018, uh, there was like a little uh, trick on the code side that um, that we started to combine the Elastic Elasticsearch with the database filtering, which was not really optimal. Uh, of course, uh, and we we, ha we had a lot of uh, troubles with that. That's why uh, in 2020, last year, we decided to migrate the whole Elasticsearch cluster from version 1.7 to 7.6. Uh, why update? Uh, I think it's really uh, obvious, but still I want to go through a bit uh, on them. Uh, first of all, the performance issues. Uh, and in, in, in 2000. 14, when the first migration is done to Elasticsearch version 1.7, uh, they decided to go with all the default configurations of Elasticsearch. Um, that time, probably it was um, totally fine uh, because of the no amount of data. But later, uh, together with the growing indexes, uh, we had uh, quite a lot of uh, issues and um, on the performance. And also, we had some uh, cluster crashing issues as well. Uh, and the second reason was there is no support for the old versions of the Elasticsearch. And Elasticsearch stopped uh, supporting 1.7 uh, after 2017. And then uh, we had some issues on the code size. Code size. Um, so when we started to use Elasticsearch 1.7, we implemented our internal REST API instead of using Elasticsearch uh, API. 
uh, yeah, we had reasons like uh, because of the dependencies on this API was too heavy and implementing it internally was easier. But this also uh, preventing, prevented us to updating the versions. Um, and as I mentioned in the previous slides, uh, we also started to use this DB and Elasticsearch combination that caused uh, so many timeouts on the database side and uh, sometimes on the Elasticsearch side. Uh, because database is not meant to do uh, filtering on the uh, millions of data, basically. And also, uh, there was no one to maintain the system. It, yeah, uh, it was working for a while, but uh, there was no specific team or a person to maintain this. Uh, that's why it uh, started to create more and more problems. Uh, so the most uh, obvious reason is that uh, also the cool features of the new versions, uh, like all the performance and memory improvements, uh, better updating uh, on the changing statuses, uh, of course, faster search, index sorting, store compression, compression and many, many more that I cannot uh, probably uh, name them here. Uh, so what was the plan that we executed? Uh, first of all, we have a live searching and there was no uh, way to uh, make this search uh, down for a while for the, the, the merchants. Uh, and on the, on the other side, um, uh, there were some misconfigurations in the cluster. Not all the data were indexed and um, we also didn't have everything correct. That's why we decided to go with the complete uh, a new cluster. Uh, it's like a, a new start uh, for us for the payment search. And then uh, as we uh, like talking here, we have uh, quite a lot of data that was really uh, hard to index at once. It was going to take so much time. Uh, and then we said, OK, let's uh, come up with a plan, observe the users, how they do the search and first uh, go with the uh, last six months of data indexing because this is uh, actually uh, most user uh, do the search on the payments. Uh, so when the six months of uh, indexing data indexing was done, uh, we we continue to index uh, all the payments uh, on a real time, and then the, uh, we enable this uh, to user by using the old and the new cluster together because. If they still want to do a search on the data before six months, it's still possible. Uh, and then the next uh, next step is, of course, to backfill all the data and get rid of all the uh, old cluster totally. Uh, how, how are we performing this indexing and updating uh, uh, process? So um, as also uh, William mentioned, we have our internal uh, streaming fr frameworks uh, because we have uh, a lot of data across to multiple accounting clusters. Uh, and in order to uh, process some summaries on this data, we need to have a scalable way to creating this. Uh, and you cannot really query the data from the accounting clusters because they are also uh, busy with um, other things. That's why you needed some scalable way. Uh, that's why uh, we implemented our streaming uh, fr a framework. Um, and uh, these frameworks get uh, the data from accounting clusters, write them into the streaming clusters, and via the uh, consumer launchers, um, uh, we read the data from uh, streams and feed the data with the consumers. Uh, so let's see how the uh, class, uh, how, how the consumer for Elasticsearch indexing and updating looks like. Uh, so all the clusters has uh, three parts. The first one is filtering the data. Uh, so uh, we get the streamed item from the from the cluster uh, from the streaming clusters. And then we can filter them uh, by saying just we only want this one, uh, uh, this type of um, uh, streams, for example. Like in my case, I, I had to do the last six months of indexing and I, I, I had the chance to say uh, just get the payments that are created uh, after a specific date. And then uh, when you get uh, the, uh, the related stream you go to the consuming part in the consuming part basically you create your object that uh, 
that you need to send to Elasticsearch. Um, so it can be either index request or uh, an update request depending on the uh, status of the payment. And then uh, you combine those, you send them uh, to the Elasticsearch and then you get the response from the Elasticsearch. Uh, but we had to make sure that uh, there was no failure in this uh, bulk operation. Why? Because we want to create a reliable uh, search functionality and if we don't uh, index one payment, then that's the problem. Uh, we solve this problem by um, getting the failures. If there is, uh, send them again for the bulk. But if this problem is continuous, then inform the people uh, who are uh, working on it uh, and fix it as soon as possible. Uh, so what are the achievements with this? Uh, first of all, uh, every day millions of new payments are made available for the real-time search. And then real-time update is also made possible uh, for the uh, changes like status, for example. Now we have more reliable search and it's faster and we also have more and more fields for searching. Uh, so I have come, uh, I have two learnings uh, from this uh, whole project. First of all, always spend your time today on something that will uh, save more time in the future. Never wreck a mole. Uh, like we did for the DB and Elasticsearch combination, it's uh, it just um, make you lose some time. And the second one is always stay up to date with the new changes like version updates and both benefit from the improvements that come with the new versions and uh, avoid the problems that will come in the future because of this um, many changes between the versions. Um, that's it. If you have any uh, questions, I can get them. Thank you. Anyone is going to ask questions in the chat. Um, we can also take them, yeah, after the last presentation. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, we will be all here, so you can ask whenever you want. Okay, awesome. Then we move on to talk number three in that case. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Let me just... Um... Okay, I just enabled Diego. Hi, Diego, can you hear us? Hi, I can. Yeah, but apparently I have a little bit of problem with my camera. With the camera? I'm going to stop, start. Can you share your screen? Is it working for you? Yeah. You guys can see my screen, right? Yeah, we can share. We can see your screen. Oh, what a bummer that the uh, video is not working. Yeah. Oh yeah, we can I'm see here you now. now. Well, perfect. It's a safari thing, I guess. All right, the floor is yours. Then there you go. Well, great. You guys can see my screen, right? It's, uh, it's still yeah. there. Yeah. Perfect. So my name is Diego. I uh, am a data scientist at Agen. Joined about uh, two years ago, and I work in the monitoring. So the monitoring is kind of a interesting team in every kind of company because uh, we don't really produce any data per se but uh, we're responsible for overseeing a lot of the things of the company it's uh, usually the first one to be blamed at if uh, something goes wrong so it's uh, always a fun right um but we are the monitoring we're pretty much responsible for building tools as generic as possible because yeah the whole company needs to use them and they all have some different use case. So we have to be generic and generalize on top of all the abstractions that people come up with to represent their data. And uh, yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to do at, uh, here at Agen. So one of the things that we have to keep in mind in the monitoring when we started as a team, but we also, whenever we build something new is that, okay, 
we have to put some constraints in place of what we can actually do in terms of monitoring because the sky is the limit. But I think that uh, one of the few, well, the very first thing that we think of monitor the platform, which is uh, not a small task for any kind of merchant facing issue. And it's also not a, not a very simple thing considering how many merchants we have at Agen and all of them, they operate on different time zones and the problems can come up at different places, especially since we have a lot of the, a lot of the infrastructure developed in house. And on top of that, we want to see some uh, alerts in real time, right? Because it doesn't really matter if, uh, okay, if I had some outage yesterday, I'm not getting a signal today that uh, not going to do any good to anyone. And on top of that, we also have, need to have some end to end monitoring because it's, it's quite nice to have a job that is running, but uh, how do you operate this job? How do you customize this job? How do you make sure that you have, yeah, the special little setting that you want to tweak in order to have this job running something specially for you? Yeah, you being this specific team that has this specific problem. So these are the things that we always try to take in consideration when we're, whenever you're, be, we're building a new solution or just changing an existing solution. So generic is kind of, uh, yeah, it's our main goal and also available for all teams. So if you think of, uh, of a company like Agen, what a risk department needs is completely different different from what a treasury department is looking for in terms of monitoring, whatever they do. And well, also it has to be integrated because a lot of the stuff that we have at Agent, they have been built from scratch. And that is something that uh, we're very proud to, uh, to, to say that. So the monitoring is also need to just be sort of a plug and play on top of all of this infrastructure that we have and preferably scalable, right? Because it's a, it, it, it shouldn't be that complicated to do that. So of course we chose Elasticsearch to do that and we are a heavy user of Elasticsearch. And this is a just some simple diagram so we can demonstrate a little bit what the flow looks like. So we have different jobs, some of the jobs that uh, Willem mentioned, for example, as Paul that uh, there is accepting payments and they all come up with their own events, right? So uh, the events from the payments, they're completely different from the events of a risk. They're completely different from the events of an accounting job or an accounting app. And all of them, they have to generate their own data. And we are the monitoring, we're responsible for just looking at the data and coming up with ways to allow the teams to monitor them in a meaningful way, because it's not just about making sure that uh, they're missing, or they're too many, or they're too little, or they are just with a wrong format. I think those are things that are pretty well developed by some different tools. And uh, we at monitoring, we would do something a little bit more, a little bit out of that scope. So if, uh, let me try to explain a little bit of the diagram. I think it's, a, it's pretty self-explanatory, but most of these data, they're just going through Filebit and Logstash, and they have two different places to go. So one, we have our own cluster, mostly for, uh, mostly for monitoring. So the, payment cluster that Bengisu mentioned, it's completely separated for the monitoring cluster. And also we have a few other Elasticsearch cluster that are going to be mentioned also in, a, in this presentation. And we are the monitoring, we are responsible for this data that is coming from all of the jobs, from all of the teams that the other, the, the other teams and departments at Agent are, uh, are creating. And uh, we provide those tools and with that, we use this data to be the source of our own monitors, of our own jobs. So we have our jobs and for example, a developer or also an account manager wants to monitor something, they have their business needs and they're going to set that up all by themselves. 
So this tooling, it's something that we, uh, we constantly improve and we take a lot of feedback from the other teams in order to make sure that the use case is covered and is also effectively something that is, uh, the other teams can also use. So once that, uh, once this data that is coming in real time, it hits our uh, Elasticsearch cluster, it is pretty much available. And, and it's going to be uh, looked into by uh, hundreds of monitors. They're running on a, on a minute basis, on an hourly basis, weekly basis. Yeah, you can configure them as much as you want to. And this whole pipeline also is, doesn't end when something is a signal because it also has to be dispatched and it's going to be dispatched by, uh, to, by email to someone that developed this monitor, but also by uh, Mattermost slash Slack message, by, uh, by, by SMS also. And uh, this data doesn't only live in Elasticsearch, but it also, it's also pushed into a Hadoop cluster. So we have full visibility and we can do some uh, large scale analysis on top of them to come up with our own models and to improve some of the some of the models that we have and to retrofit the monitors back into into production with something more uh, more up to date that's something that we do pretty much on a daily basis so from a business perspective uh, i have my data and i have a few things that i can do with them so the data will pretty much come in different shapes and forms but at the end it's still the same right so we one of the things that we have to provide and we can provide is to give the the monitors with some uh, customizable but still very predefinable use cases so a few use cases are very a very similar right you want to look for a spike in some sort of event you want to look for a drop or if you want to look for a flat line, whatever, something just stops from existing. You want to be alerted on uh, any kind of anomaly if you have a strong signal. But you also, if it's not an anomaly per se, but it's uh, underperforming, it's just not as good as expected or it was a couple of week, weeks ago. This is something that we also can provide out of the box. And a few things are also just they just exist just by the, the sake of existing for some of these events, such as uh, response time measures. That is something that it's uh, completely transparent and exists out of the box. You don't even even you don't even have to create them. And another thing that you can also create for from your own model, because the teams, the different teams, they're going to have different necessities when it comes to building their own machine learning models. For example, you can come up with a monitor that is going to take an input. Uh, the, the, the input would be the output of the machine learning model combined with your data that is uh, lives in Elasticsearch. So this, this two things combined and all of these use cases, they're already 85, 90% of the use cases that most of the teams really really want to look into. And from the developer perspective, well, I mentioned that some of these events, especially for uh, the platform base, like uh, hosts, DB queries, cache access, they come with a few things out of the box. Um, from the developer, this is also pretty transparent, right? So for example, on your right, I put an example of what does it looks like? So on a Java, if you look from a Java perspective, you create your uh, your class, a, a very simple POJO, you put a field, you put a parameter and just call a log. And that's pretty much all you need. You don't, need, you don't, you don't even have to worry about coming up with your schema because this is also something that is uh, occurring in the, in the background level. And this schema is also automatically translated to uh, Elasticsearch template, but also to uh, an Avro schema. So this data is uh, is automatically saved and dispatched to both platforms and can be used. And they'll have 
do you have schemas that are uh, just valid to be to be materialized into these two platforms or if you don't even have want to bother by creating your own specific event you can also just log your uh, your events by uh, calling standard log4j uh, logs and and this is also something that can create an analytic event depends on what you're logging and these events they are just going through the same route has an uh, has an event that is uh, created like the the, the, the the example above so this this whole infrastructure is it lives it's it's not something that is taking precedence over some different um, some different logging capability for example this is not replacing a database or this is not replacing a logging infrastructure this is a complementary infrastructure that lives there for not this i I'm, i won't say that is the sole purpose of it is to serve to the to monitor but it, you can also just use it to populate data and use this data for some uh, long-term analysis, for example, this is something that you can do. And the added benefit is that you can monitor on top of it in real time. So this whole infrastructure that has been created is something that it's continuously evolving. And, and the idea is to make it as simple as possible by increasing and tooling, and also to make it as simple as possible to just create your data, create your, uh, your, your POJO and just logging it. And you don't have to worry about schemas or any kind of uh, uh, migrations, and uh, you just know that it's going to exist if you if you use them. So this is a little bit on a very high level how we do some of this monitoring on uh, here at Agen and um, how we benefit from Elasticsearch. So questions. Awesome. Thank you, Diego. Let's see if we have any questions. I think we have one question now in the in the chat. You see it? Yeah. Yes. All of the data is uh, all of the all of the alerts are based on uh, Elasticsearch data and we have different sampling sizes it depends on the data it depends on what it looks like because well if an event is uh is very rare is very sparse you might have to adjust your sampling size and that is something that some of the algorithms we we do that automatically do you manage alerts based on pure events well we do have uh, another layer of uh of alerts, so an alert will not necessarily create a, a signal because you can add another layer on top of that kind of a blue-based system on top of everything that you generate. But uh, yes, it's a pure Elasticsearch event. Okay. Awesome. Let's move forward and we'll take more questions in at the end. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Diego. Let me just. Hi, can you hear us? Yes, let's see if this works. Try yes. To turn awesome. Well, good luck. Right. Uh, I think you can see the screen, right? Yeah. Yes. Cool. So, uh, thanks everyone for joining. I'll skip the introduction part, um, mostly because Willem already talked about uh, what IDM does as a company. Um, I'll uh, focus mostly on on logging. Uh, and keep in mind, I'm not a developer. I'm um, currently a platform reliability engineer at IDM. I've been with the company for around five years. Uh, so I'll be speaking about Elasticsearch. Uh, from an infrastructure perspective or, or from an operational perspective. Um, and with this with this short talk, I'll try to uh, 
let's say maybe maybe this will help others make a good decisions from the the early implementation uh, stages when when implementing an elastic based uh, infrastructure or logging platform so in short um I'll be focusing on application logs, um, mostly because system logs are in general boring. Boring as in, um, okay, they have interesting information, but they're boring from a log processing perspective because the format is usually uh, mostly static and uh, unpredictable. Um, at IDM, we have multiple logging clusters uh, per log type, per environment, and in some cases, even per data center. Um, and focusing on application logs, uh, in most of these clusters, we ingest multiple terabytes of logs every day uh, with rates ranging between 30, 70, 80,000 lines per second uh, per cluster. Uh, we'll, we'll also see a couple of uh, issues we run into while scaling the cluster. And then um, we'll see what we learned from this and why we had to um, re-implement it in the end. And I'll tie a little bit into uh, Bengisu's presentation about uh, uh, version differences and um, upgrades versus migrations <clears throat> so the, the infrastructure is quite simple um, initially we just based our log transport on syslog mostly because we already had it and in general we had very little issues with it um, it's also a unix standard so um, yeah it's it's there to stay uh, initially the log volumes were pretty low so we, we simply collocated log stash on the one of the central log servers uh, but yeah, logs are good, uh, so we had to scale up. Um, from from logs, we could extract a lot of useful information, and, and that's that's crucial or critical uh, in case there's an issue with the platform itself. So in general, the logging platform should be more reliable than the actual production platform. So as soon as we started processing more logs, we started seeing the first uh, scaling issues or scaling challenges. Um, First of all, the ingest rate. So more logs, you need more processing power to actually process those logs, those logs and get something meaningful out of them. Um, retention, of course, uh, the platform is also growing. So more applications, more machines means more logs and more storage required for those logs. And last but not least, complexity. And I'm not talking about complexity of the platform itself, uh, but more about the complexity of the logs. Um, also because logs are coming from different or multiple sources, multiple applications. So first challenge, the ingest rates, uh, because we based our, our platform or our logging platform on uh, syslog transport, uh, we had to deal with plain text logs and the application logs are in general multi-line logs. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, imagine a, a log entry like this. So you have a, um, a message and then let's say a Java stack trace, which normally takes multiple lines. Um, and when processing those logs, you actually have to make sure you stitch those lines together into a single event. Otherwise, uh, those separate lines don't mean anything. Um, yeah, it would be easier to settle on a more structured format, um, let's say JSON, um, but we'll, we'll get to that um, a little bit later. And since the logs are multi-line, um, again, the, we were using the multi-line codec in log stash, but then you're limiting your um, uh, whole pipeline to a single process, which does not uh, does not scale. Uh, what did we do with this? So the first change was to implement a log multiplexer. Uh, this is actually something that we built in house. Uh, and this, this log multiplexer, which we call the log sender, it is just doing the multi-line processing, so stitching uh, multiple lines together into uh, unique events, um, and then distributing those events to multiple Logstash backends. So let's say if, if the, the filtering part in Logstash does not have enough resources, uh, we can just spin up a few more machines, and uh, uh, then we run into a different issue. Uh, so the log sender becomes the single point of failure or the bottleneck in this situation, which we're now replacing with. Um, with a streaming uh, framework or streaming framework, but different from, from the application side. So it's, it's in this case, we're looking at Kafka and we already have um, a couple of clusters using that. Um, the second challenge, retention. Um, well, um, as also Benisu said, people are usually searching for recent events. Um, in terms of logging, we aim to keep several months of logs available in Elasticsearch. Um, mostly for operational purposes. Uh, and from those, 
let's say three months of data, usually the, the last few days are uh, actively used and the rest is used only in, in cases where when we're looking at some uh, historical issues. So to because Rackspace is limited um, and since we're, we're running most of our platform on bare metal, um, initially we decided to go with the so-called archive nodes, which are literally Elasticsearch machines with more storage. So uh, I think five times the storage of a normal node and twice the, the RAM, uh, which worked quite well uh, for a while. Uh, but then as we get more and more logs, this starts becoming a bottleneck as well. Uh, because the storage is not really matched to the CPU or uh, RAM size. Uh, and to move data to those archive nodes, we just started um, using and abusing the shard allocation settings in Elasticsearch. So for each index, you can say, okay, this index should only be present on nodes that have this specific tag, in our case, archive. <coughs> um, why are we doing this? Well, mostly we, we were using a literally a nightly cron job that would get the list of indexes and tag them for archival or for, for deletion. Um, we could also use the um, index lifecycle management uh, functionality, but as with payment search, we were running uh, version 1.7, which didn't have any of those fancy features. And uh, yeah, the third challenge would be complexity. Um, complexity in logs and also because we're using plain text logs, Adding new fields would mean with every change we had to um, change the log stash configuration to parse more and more stuff, which became becomes slower. And since we wanted to have better insights into the platform, um, we needed a way to extract more fields out of each log. Uh, so we started abusing the um, dynamic mapping functionality in Elasticsearch. Uh, in short, what is dynamic mapping? Elasticsearch is trying to be smart and in most cases that's a good thing um, so it tries to auto detect the data type of all the fields you're trying to ingest uh, the problem with this is when you're uh, aggregating logs or data from multiple sources you might run into conflicts uh, so let's consider two different applications that are um, logging a field called response time to a human if you look at those uh, two values, it does, it's not a real, let's say, difference, um, except that you might notice the first one is a number, the second one is a string. So because Elasticsearch is auto-detecting the type, if the number gets first to the index, then uh, that type, that field will be defined as a number. And then when you have the same, uh, an event with the same name or the same key, but with a string in it, Elasticsearch will refuse to index it. So in this case, you start losing data. Um, an easy fix would be to predefine the data type or to enforce somehow in the logging library uh, the, the data type for each field, which is a little bit more complex. Um, to make our, our lives easier and the developers' lives easier as well, we started using JSON logging uh, in this uh, logging cluster, um, but not JSON in the real sense. It's more like embedded JSON. Uh, so this just allows allows one to to throw a JSON representation of the fields they want to log or they want to expose to, to expose into the into the plain text logs, and then the log stash pipeline will um, extract that JSON string and expose it into several fields, which might uh, cause uh, mapping conflicts again. So eventually, um, we we can hit the so-called mapping explosion when some application is generating a huge amount of fields with seemingly random names or with, let's say, just a huge amount of fields with different key names. Um, when running a more recent version of Elasticsearch, this should not be a real issue uh, because there's a um, setting that allows you to limit the total number of fields per index, um, but that was only introduced in Elasticsearch 5.0, as far as I remember. Um, with, a, with a rather sensible default. So uh, thanks Elastic for that. Um, since we were running an older version, this was an actual issue. Um, and again, mapping conflicts, uh, which is, can be partially solved by uh, either using static mappings, which was not an option for us, uh, or trying to predefine the fields that we know that they can cause conflicts. Um, Again, because of the features available in the newer versions, at some point we had to update, but when we got to that stage, uh, it was sort of too late um, to, to actually update. So we had to migrate to a completely new uh, infrastructure, mostly because going from 1.7 to 
seven dot something means multiple steps of re-indexing all the data, which is not really feasible. So we decided to start from scratch uh, in parallel with the, the current logging infrastructure uh, and only attempt to cover a subset of the requirements we had for the logging platform. And that's how the um, project that we called Elastic One was born, which Diego talked about um, earlier. So we're logging directly in JSON. Uh, we have almost static mappings and the, the application itself is generating the template for the indexes and it enforces types for each of the fields that are being logged. And we're also aiming for real time or near real time because real time doesn't really exist in theory. Um, and we're, we're aiming for a few seconds of latency between the, the moment that the event was created until it's available in Elasticsearch. And what did we learn from this? Um, it's, a, it's a set of mostly common good practices that you can apply in any other project. But in our case, based on Elasticsearch uh, or based on in our implementation, um, I would say you need to avoid unnecessary complexity, size your clusters accordingly. And uh, I think uh, the guys at Elastic can come with really good recommendations there. Um, use the, the new features that are available uh, in the products as such as index lifecycle management, which allows you to easily change templates on the fly. Um, and Elasticsearch will automatically take care of your retention. Um, also, when putting something new in production, try to do some benchmarks. And again, um, ES Australia, it's a tool that I think it's, it was born at Elastic as well, and it's, uh, it can be used to benchmark. And first of all, monitor everything from the start. Uh, I'm talking about system metrics and Elasticsearch specific metrics. Um, the Prometheus ecosystem is becoming a standard nowadays. So you could, you could use the Elasticsearch exporter, the Logstash exporter, if you're running a full ELK stack. Um, if you're running on, let's say, uh, already have a graphite-based monitoring system, you could use the um, graphite output in Logstash and then generate metrics from there. Or if you're running a recent version of Elasticsearch, you could also use a smaller um, monitor cluster to collect metrics and logs from Elasticsearch. And in this case, of course, store it on a separate cluster, not on the same that, that's being monitored. Um, another thing that we kind of failed to do at some point, and that's why we had to start over, um, we didn't keep up with the, with the new versions as they were, they were released because we were fighting uh, performance issues. So I do have to say we managed to scale our infrastructure quite well. Um, and last time I checked, I think we had more than one petabyte of data in a single cluster. Um, but yeah, to, to avoid running into technical debt issues, try just to be on top of things and um, update when new versions are released. If you're running in the cloud, this is a bit easier. Just you just spin up an extra environment. Um, but if you're running on bare metal, as we do, just try to have different clusters, slightly different versions, so that the breaking change uh, in between versions does not break the entire fleet. Or even run a small playground cluster where you can do benchmarks or, or test your your configuration with new versions. And yeah, last but not least, educate educate your users. Um, users meaning um, analysts, um, other other teams, developers. Um, first of all, use use technology to enforce some standards, like we did with the logging library, uh, which again Diego mentioned earlier, um, where you can use technology to enforce a uh, same um, say same data coming into your cluster. Again, try to document everything, do workshops and discuss best practices, document those pra best practices and make the documentation easily available to other teams or other people. And also engage with, uh, with your users or with the teams that are using Elastic uh, from the early implementation phases. And this will literally save you a lot of time in the long run. And that's what we did with uh, the monitoring pipeline or Elastic One. We decided from the start how we want this to look like. So, and we built, we built on top of that. Uh, short note, this talk used to actually take 30, 40 minutes, so I had to cut a lot of stuff from it. Um, but I hope I did manage to, to cover some of the aspects that are interesting. I think that's it for me. Um, if there are any questions, please shoot. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you. It was great. Let's see if we have any questions. I'll bring all the presenters um, on the screen so everyone can participate all right so uh i see a question versus file beat um 
because we based our, our log transport on syslog, we didn't really use Filebit until recently. Um, we do use Filebit on the monitoring side of things um, because of, uh, of JSON logging and, and Filebit supports that natively and can also manipulate the data already in Filebit. Um, they are indeed complementary, but Logstash is, uh, say, way more flexible, but at the same time, it's slower. So you need to find the balance between the two. Um, again, uh, question for Peter. How did you decide what the optimal index sharding and replication are? Um, this is something that evolved with time. So in the, in the beginning, the decisions were based on the amount of data we had to index. And of course, those parameters change over time, but the, the index and chart size were not always um, kept in sync with that. So that's something we're, we're trying to um, avoid going forward is by, by just running a newer version and, and um, relying on the index lifecycle management where we can say, okay, this index can only be this big. And then if it reaches this size, the index is being, uh, um, let's say, rotated. And the next one, I think it's about not Elasticsearch. <laughs> Willem, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, I can. Well, I'm wondering what's meant with the compute nodes. Is that the reporting? Uh... Yeah, well, maybe it's good to expand on the charting. It's not according to, it's basically round robin. So it's not that, that we'd make, um, we have some logic on top of it, but basically all the charts are, um, they're equivalent, uh, at least in theory. <laughs> um, and then the computation, yeah, we just aggregate it and then, uh, um, yeah, there are a lot of replicas, right? For each database. Uh, if you're talking about Elasticsearch replicas, um, we do use replicas on the charts um mostly the, depending on the situation and let's say some clusters that have to be really fast we just don't use replication um or we don't use replicas on the indexes because it, it's short-lived data um on stuff like payment search we use um multiple replicas uh, again depending on the size of the cluster um by using more than, than one replica we can also use the, the automated uh, replica selection i think that's what it's called in Elasticsearch. So, yeah. yeah, again, I think this, these are like the charting I mentioned was more on the on the accounting side, right? Not on the elastic side. I sh maybe should have been more clear there. Maybe uh, also good to mention there will be a summary of uh, of this talk in a, a form of a blog post. I think it's the same blog that was uh, referenced earlier, but. Uh, I'll share the link here again. Um, somewhere in the coming days, you will see, uh, see a new entry appear there. The question from uh, Janderson, if I pronounced that correctly. Are there any open challenges on educating users regarding the login infrastructure? Um, Yes and no. Uh, that's why I said use technology to uh, to actually uh, uh, enforce some uh, some things, and then by providing a library that developers can easily use, they don't really need to know all the details. Um, otherwise, you would have to talk about uh, dynamic mappings. You would have to think about the data type of each field, and that simply doesn't scale um, in the in the long term. Okay, I think um, we can wrap it up now unless anyone has any last questions. Okay then, thanks to our presenters. You were awesome. Thanks for uh, participating in this meetup. Uh, we hope to collaborate with you in the future again. Looking forward to the blog post. And thanks for everyone that joined today and listened. Uh, we will upload the recording to the uh, community YouTube Elastic Community channel. Let me just give you the uh, link so you can find it there. 
and maybe also good to mention that uh, we have a dev newsletter that you can subscribe to where the blog will be shared and it will also be shared on our twitter account so if you want to not refresh every day you can also follow these channels awesome all right thank you all